Good morning, Living Water Community Church. How are we doing today? Good. Good. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's stand and prepare for worship. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to lay all things down. Lord, it's not easy sometimes. This life can feel heavy. Burdens can feel heavy. Lord, we all come with our own things, and we ask that you come and meet us here today and help us lay them at your feet. You are the great physician, the great healer, the great father. Lord, we acknowledge all these things this morning in who you are. Lord, even when we don't feel like ourselves, you are constant. Lord, that is why we worship you this morning. We acknowledge who you are, what you've done, and we lift your name above all names. Help us to do that this morning. Send your spirit here to be with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Conley, and I'd like to welcome you here to Lydian Waters to worship with us. If you're new, I hope you grab a coffee mug on the way in, and if not, please feel free to grab on the way out as a thank you for joining us. As well as you're also new, in front of you, you'll see an I'm new card as you fill it out and place it in the offering box by the back door. We'd love to get to know a little more about you. Okay, we've got some announcements here we're going to go through. Okay, May 30th, there is going to be no service here. It's going to be at the uh, Head of Falls at 10 a.m. Another thing, too, is we're going back to uh, starting services at 10 a.m. starting May 30th from there on. So if you come May 30th, nobody's going to be here, so don't come up. Go to Head, go to the head of Falls. Okay, and uh, if you also look on your bulletin, you'll see some other outdoor services we've got going on. And uh, to follow, or actually preceding that, we'll have breakfast at 9 a.m. So if you're hungry, come hungry. Uh, another thing, too, at the end of this service, um, following, we have a members meeting directly after the service. I'd uh, love to have you stay, see what it's all about. Um, so if you're a member, please stay for that. And then, let's see here, May 29th, we have a men's breakfast. Any men here? Any yeah. men here? Come on. Yes, men here. Good, good. Okay. I uh, sure hope we do. Come on. But anyway, so 9 a.m., May 29th, the men's breakfast. Uh, invite some guys out. It's a great time to fellowship. We know it's kind of grow community, and we're excited to have you. Okay, before we continue in worship, we're going to have uh, John come up and open some prayer. Uh, let's uh, let's start and pray. Father God, thank you for um, bringing us here uh, in this place, Lord. And, um, God, as we just uh, enter back into worship, worship of you, Lord, I pray you would um, be in our presence, God. I pray the Holy Spirit is here in this place, Lord. And um, Lord, I just want to pray for our congregation as well, Lord, as we, we always do in this prayer. Um, just to remember that we are we are family. We are, we are together in this, God. You have brought us all into this place, um, each one of us with our own difficulties, our own struggles, God. And so I just pray for um, for marriages in this place, God. I pray for um, just uh, unity, Lord. I pray for, for any sickness that might be uh, lingering or even people that aren't here this week, God, because of something that, that they're dealing with, Lord. I pray for uh, those that are battling cancer, God. I just even pray with them. Um, I pray specifically, specifically for, for Jen that's in the hospital right now, God. And, um, and Lord, I just, I, just, I just thank you that she is receiving some healing, God, but I pray you would heal her completely and she's to be out, Lord, um, as soon as possible, God, and be able to come back together and worship with us, Lord. Uh, God, I just want to pray for um, our outreach, Lord, as we did the food card yesterday, Lord. I mean, it was so many people, Lord. Um, and Lord, I, 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 I just, I pray, Lord, that there was, I, I do believe there were seeds planted, God. But we cannot make those those seeds come to life. We cannot bring fruit. Lord, that's what you do. You bring the growth. So I pray that, that, that there will be growth, growth from that outreach event. And even our future outreach, our outreach events we do with the service in the park and the other food carts we do in the summer. Um, it's all just to, to spread the amazing news that you saved us, that you love us, God. Lord, that's what we're doing. And Lord, I pray that, that would, that's what we will, we will see. That we will see people come to know you through, through our efforts, God. Um, Lord, I pray that that as we do all this stuff too, that us as a congregation, we can remember and keep this on our minds that we're not doing this to glorify our name or the name of living water or ourselves. We're doing it to glorify you. I pray that it stays in the front of our mind as we go out and do anything that we do um, as a church family. God, just blow our minds, Lord, with what you're going to do in this community. God, bring revival. Uh, Lord, I pray for other churches that are that are meeting even right now, God, that are also preaching <coughs> the gospel, just preaching the word. I pray that you would grow them. Uh, you would um, help there to be unity among the churches, God, as we go out and, and spread the same news that you died, you rose, you love <coughs> us, and you will return one day. So I pray that news will be proclaimed from the rooftops, Lord. And so as we enter back into worship, God, today, I pray <coughs> that you just set our hearts in the right place. Set our minds in the right place. God, help us to cast away anything that that is uh, that is lingering right now, God, in this place. And uh, set our minds and our hearts in the right place. Lord, we thank you and love you. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
just stand and prepare for worship.
Welcome to Living Water. Uh, good to be here this morning. Um, so, as Tim said, he remembers me after the service today. Um, we always kind of say this, but just to kind of reiterate it, uh, you don't have to be a member to um, stay. Uh, we will be, I, I would encourage all members to have to stay. Uh, we're going to be welcoming a few new members to our, to our church family. Um, but we're also going to be talking um, about some vision for the future um, and also a challenge um, for all of us to do for the next couple of weeks. Um, and so whether you're a member or you're not, I would encourage every, everyone that if you can consider this your church to stay and, um, and stay after. Plus, there's, there's food. So <laughs> you just want lunch after, stay after for a little bit. So. Uh, yesterday was the food cart, so if you guys came out and were, were able to come check out what happened there, uh, it was amazing. We had probably the best turnout we've had um, since we, we've done it since we started it last year. Um, I don't know how many people there were, there was definitely over 100, but it was really awesome uh, to be back out in our community. Um, we did the bus for a little bit, but it wasn't the same as actually setting out tables and it was a nice, beautiful day, so people were out congregating, talking, fellowshipping. Um, so it was really cool. Uh, so we're doing it again. We're doing it once a month for the next, for the entire summer. We're also doing, as we talked about the park, the service in the park. Um, I think it's so important, we'll talk about this in the members meeting too, but it's so important for a church to be, to go. Like I talk about this often, it's not, it's like the great commission. It's not the great come mission. It's the great go. And go, therefore, and make disciples. We are to go and make disciples, but we got to leave this building. And we have to go do stuff, right? It's not we're going to sit inside. We expect people to come to us. We have to go to them sometimes. And so that's why we're doing that once a month. We're getting out. We're doing exactly what Jesus did. We preach in public all the time. Uh, the apostles were preaching in public all the time. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing is going out in public preaching the gospel together as a family, church family together. So, really excited for what God is doing, um, especially for the summer. I love summer. I love this. I mean, all of summer. But it's it's just something about doing ministry in the summer. It's just there's so many more opportunities compared to the winter where everyone's <laughs> locked inside and miserable. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> enough of me talking. Let's go. Let's get into the book of Ruth. Um, Ruth chapter 4, we're going to be this morning. Ruth chapter 4. Um, we're going to finish up our series in Ruth. It's the last chapter in Ruth, so um, it is the end. And this book has been filled with cliffhangers. Um, every single week, it's like, there's just like, it's drawing you in, wanting more. If this was a TV show, like I said, you probably would binge watch the entire thing and just want to know what the ending is. And I, I do hope that many of you did read ahead. You know the ending, or maybe you've read this book before, so you know how this story ends. And even if you haven't, you probably can guess. If you've been following along as we go through the book of Ruth, you probably can guess how the story is going to, to end. So before we get into chapter 4, though, let's just bring us up to speed. All of us, we can get an understanding of what we've gone through the past uh, four weeks and before we dive into the, the text this morning. So Ruth, in chapter 1, it starts out with a tragedy. We're introduced to a family. You have... Uh, a mom, you have a dad, you have two sons, and this family leaves Bethlehem and they go to Moab, and they leave Bethlehem because there's a famine in the land, so basically they go to Moab in search of a better life, they're in search of hope, you could say, a future, there's no future in Bethlehem, so they go to Moab to maybe find food, to maybe find a future, well in chapter one the story turns very quickly into a tragedy, so we find out that a middle neck husband dies, and then years after this, Naomi, her two sons, Malon and Chilion, also died. So we're left in chapter 1 with this mother, Naomi, pretty much lost everything, and now she has, she's left with two daughter-in-laws. Well, Naomi then decides to go back to her hometown of Bethlehem. She goes back in hopes that maybe someone will show her favor. She has friends, she has relatives back in uh, but Mo, uh, Bethlehem, so she's thinking, well, somebody will show kindness towards me and help me in this rough time. Well, one of her daughter-in-laws, Orpha, stays in Moab. The other one, Ruth, title of the book, clings to Naomi. And so they turn to, when they both return to Bethlehem, Naomi and Ruth, 
instead of being greeted with excitement, her friends and family are excited they come they're, that they're back and they're welcome with open arms, we get an understanding that they're greeted with judgment. They're greeted with a cold shoulder. They're greeted with uh, people with their noses turning up, of, of not really excited that they came back at all. And so we're left in chapter 1 with a question. And the author does this all throughout the book of Ruth, with, with these questions that we're left with. Will Ruth and Naomi find favor? Is somebody going to show them kindness? Is somebody, is somebody going to show them some bit of compassion? Well, in chapter 2, it opens up. We get, we're introduced to this new character. There's this man named Boaz. He's a worthy man. And he also happens to be a relative of Naomi. And so Ruth sets out to find favor or to, to glean in somebody's field. It's barley season, there's all kinds of food, to, there's plenty of food around, so she goes, and goes to a field in hopes to maybe find some scraps. That's the idea. You glean in a field, the workers, they, they always leave some stuff behind as part of the Old Testament law, they had to do this, and so there's, there, she, was, she, she would glean in a field and hope to find some food for her and Naomi. But the text kind of hints at the, the plan here. She just so happens to end up in Boaz's field. Almost by mistake, she just wanders into Boaz's field. And immediately we find out that Boaz takes notice of her. He pursues her. He looks at her. He likes her. There's something about her that catches his eye. And so first thing he does, he gives her, he gives her an abundance of food. He makes sure she has all the food she could want. Then he also protects her. He says, stay in my field. Don't go to the other fields. Because if you go to the other fields, there could be some uh, immoral workers. Or the field owner could be abusive. He could abuse you. He could beat you. He could even possibly rape you or even kill you. Like there's some terrible things that could happen to Ruth if she ends up in the wrong field. But she's in Boaz's field. Now the question that the author leaves us, leaves us with in chapter 1 seems to be answered. Because Boaz now seems to be the one that's going to show Ruth and Naomi favor. So Boaz is the one that's going to show them kindness and compassion. But now, and now you also see this romance forming. But the end of chapter 2, we, nothing happens. You've got two to three months that go by, and you got the barley harvest, and you got the wheat harvest, and no sparks flying. You don't got any dates between Boaz and Ruth. There's nothing happening. It's just, it seems to be going very, very slow. And so we kind of have to wonder, well, maybe Boaz is not going to marry Ruth at all. Maybe Boaz isn't going to redeem Ruth. Maybe Boaz just feels bad for these two women. He's having pity on them. He's just making sure they're not going to starve to death. He's just going to make sure they have what they need. Well, in chapter 3, what we looked at last week, Naomi gets a little bit pushy. And she wants to see if Boaz is really serious about Ruth. And so she comes up with this plan. And the plan, as we looked at last week, from, from my study, I, I see this plan as a very malicious and sinful plan. And it's honest, honestly a very dangerous plan for, for Ruth. Her plan was for Ruth to dress up, put perfume on, make herself look beautiful, and then to sneak into Boaz's bed at night. And then let Boaz tell her what to do. You're just playing this out in your head. You already know this is a terrible idea. Like a woman all dressed up getting into a, bed's man, a, a man's bed at night. That's not a good idea at all. And so last week we tried to look at the motive. Why did Naomi do this? Why was this Naomi's plan? It seems like a terrible idea. And we looked at probably two motives. There was one, it could be a trap for Boaz. Either way, it's kind of a trap for Boaz. Either he would kick Ruth out of, her, out of his bed Say, what are you doing in my bed? Get out of here. What, 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 what are you thinking? This is, this, is, this is immoral. This isn't right for a woman to do this. Get out of my bed. And then, tragically for Ruth, she probably would be charged with adultery, and she would have been killed under Old Testament law. Or the other scenario would be that Boaz would sleep with Ruth. They might have a child. Ruth would get pregnant. And then they would have to get married. So Naomi has some malicious intent here, some sinful intent. She, she either, either she would find out that Boaz was not interested in Ruth at all, and they cross him out, he's not the redeemer, he's not going to marry Ruth, or they, Ruth gets pregnant, and they have to get married, he redeems her, right? Either way, this scenario is, is awful. It's an awful idea. But the way it turns out is amazing. 
And it turns out this way because Ruth does not listen to Naomi's plan. And thank God she didn't listen to Naomi. Instead of letting Boaz tell her what to do, Ruth instead tells Boaz what to do. She tells him in chapter 3, verse 9, she tells Boaz, Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. She asked Boaz to redeem her. Really, in essence, what she's saying is, Marry me, Boaz. This, this, is, this is Ruth's proposal. Understand, Ruth proposed to Boaz. That's how this worked. Okay? She, she's, a, she's a very strong-willed woman, you can see this here. She proposed to Boaz. And Boaz says, yes, I will redeem you, but there's a problem, though. We'll kind of wrench them into the story. There is another redeemer. There's somebody else that comes before Boaz. You've got to understand here, we're going to see this as played out in chapter 4 today, that there's, this is a legal process that's had to happen here. And it was according, according to that custom at that time, but also according to something called levitrate marriage. There were some laws in the, in, in the Old Testament book that God gave for this, for this redeeming process to happen. But what's amazing, though, is we're left with in chapter 3, is that Boaz, is, Boaz promises Ruth that she will be redeemed. She will be redeemed. And, she, and Boaz is not going to rest until Ruth finds rest. Boaz is not going to rest. He's not, gonna, not going to, to settle down until Ruth is redeemed that very day. So they wake up, and that next day, Boaz is set out in a pursuit. To, he has a plan for, for Ruth to be redeemed. So let's dive into chapter 4 this morning. We are at the point now in chapter 4. This is the climax of the entire story. This is it. It's the pinnacle of it. You can see it kind of the, the story arc here. It's at the very peak of it. We start to ask, who is the redeemer? Who is, who is this other guy? Is he kind like Boaz? Is he a nice guy? It will, will Ruth even find rest? Maybe this guy's abusive. It's going to be a terrible situation for, for Ruth. And I know all of us at this point, like, we're, we're all rooting for Boaz. We're hoping, we're just hoping this other guy is going to say, no, I'm all set with Ruth. I don't really want her. We're hoping that happens and Boaz steps forward and marries her. That's what we're hoping. So let's get in. Let's see what happens. Chapter Four, verse 1. If you're new with us, we just to remind you, we do not put the verse on the screen. Uh, we do this so we all can be in God's Word together. So if you have a Bible, open it up. If you don't have them, there's one in front of you. Um, and uh, if you don't have a Bible at all, please take the one in front of you um, as our gift to you. So, chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and, and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. So what we can see happening here very quickly is that Boaz has a plan. Actually, the title of the sermon I called this morning was, was The Plan of Redemption. Right? Boaz had a planned out process of how he was going to redeem Ruth. And so what he does, he waits outside the gate. Now the gate, from what we understand, would be a courthouse. Understand? This is a legal procedure that's going to happen here. So he's outside the courthouse, and most likely the courthouse is in the town center. So people are walking by constantly, and what does Boaz do? He sits there, and he waits. We don't know how long the guy waits. He just sits there and waits till this redeemer just so happens to walk by. I mean, he could have been waiting there all day for this guy. I mean, you got to remember, I know this is kind of crazy to think, but they didn't have cell phones. Okay, they don't have phones here. Okay, so they, they had to, like, I mean, for us, if we just call somebody up, hey, can you meet me down here at this time, or, or can I get this person's number? None of that. They, he's had to wait until this guy just so happens to walk by. And then he had to find ten elders. Now, these elders were leaders in the community. These were uh, possibly, could be an elected official or somebody. They, they at least, they had prominence in the town. So he found ten elders, and he got them all into the room together for a legal trial. Now, this was a lot of work to be done by, by Boaz. And it's important to remember here, at the beginning of the story, he's doing this for Ruth. Because he doesn't even know if he's going to marry her. He, he, at the beginning of the story, I mean, we, we, you can read ahead and find out what happens, but at the beginning of this, Boaz does not know if he will marry Ruth or not. This guy could decide to take Ruth as his wife, and then Boaz doesn't have a wife. 
Like he's just all this work, all, everything he's trying to do to set this all up, it is all for nothing for himself. Ruth makes out good, but he could just get nothing at the end of this. But he's doing this all for her. It's amazing. Continue on in verse Verse 3. Then he said, said to the Redeemer, Boaz said to the Redeemer, Naomi has come back from the country of Moab and is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Amilamech. So he tells her, basically, that this, this land's up for grabs. This land, this possession, the, and it's up for grabs for one of the relatives of Amilamech, whoever wants it. And you're the first one, as he goes on in verse 4. So, so I thought I would tell you of it. And say, buy in the presence of those sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me, that I, that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Now, if you just think of this whole scenario for a minute, like, of course this guy is going to say yes. I mean, the beginning of it, and, and, and verse 5 is so pivotal. <laughs> I love how Boaz does this. But before we get to verse 5, look at ver what he's doing. Like, why wouldn't you? I mean, you understand, I mean, uh, Amilamech had land, most likely a house. He had possessions. He had an inheritance. And Boaz tells this guy, well, all you have to do is redeem it. All you have to do is say you want it, and you get it all. Now, most likely, probably part of this would be he would have to take care of Naomi. There's a mention of Naomi here. So he understands that he probably would have to care for Naomi in her old age. But you think about it, it's a small price to pay for the wealth to be gained. Like he, so, he, so he takes care of Naomi. He probably had a mom of his own. Not a big deal. He makes sure she's cared for. She has a place to live. But then he gains all of this land, possessions, and all this wealth. But then we got verse 5. <laughs> like I said, I love what Boaz does. Boaz had a plan here. Very strategic plan. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And like I said, little Boaz does it. What he does is, this guy already said, Yes, I'll do it. And of course, it's a no brainer. Why wouldn't you? But then he said, But, but also, uh, we, don't, we, we don't even know this guy's name. I wish we knew his name. But. But we don't even know his name. He basically says, I also forgot to mention, um, you also got to marry Ruth. Um, and notice the title he gives her, the Moabite. Like the Ruth, the Moabite. She's not a, a, a woman that you really want. Like he's trying to, trying to kind of hint at her like, <laughs> like no Israelite man in his right mind is going to want to marry this woman. And Boaz knows this. This is why he leaves it at the end. He, he got, sets this whole thing up like, you get land, you get wealth, you get all this stuff, but... You also get this woman over here that no one in their right mind would ever want. Wow. <laughs> I'm just being honest. This is society, okay? Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she was a great woman. Which obviously she was, reading the text. But in this society, she was, and this is what you can see, clearly see that Ruth was seen as an outcast. Boaz is playing this out. She was seen as gross. She was seen as unwanted, unclean. Nobody would want her. This is why Boaz is doing this. So verse 6, see what this man's response is. And the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem her for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. The man says, she, so I have to marry Ruth in order to do this? Yeah, I'm all set. Like, go ahead. I, I want nothing to do with her. I don't want her at all. Like, I, I, this man would give up land, possessions, wealth, all because, think about this, Ruth is seen as that disgusting of a person. Now, as the text says here, though, he says that I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Like, you read this verse, you think, well, like, why did he say this? And this is, it's a really good thing, honestly. I don't think Ruth was here. And thank God she wasn't here to, um, to see this whole thing unfold. Because what this guy is saying, this, this is a huge bash to her. Basically, what he's saying here, as far as we know, this man was not married. And the reason why you think he's not married is because he is up for, to be one of the redeemers. If he was married, most likely he wouldn't be uh, an option as a redeemer. He'd be crossed off a list. So what he's saying here is, I don't want to have children with a Moabite woman. Because that child from Ruth would also have the right to my inheritance. This guy also had wealth. This guy also had land and a house. So he's basically saying, I don't want a half-bred child having my inheritance. You just think about this. And it's so, it's, 
I mean, thank God this, this guy did not marry Ruth. He was not a, a honorable man at all. And the man says to Boaz, in essence, dude, she's all yours. Like, I don't know what is wrong with you, Boaz. I don't know what you see in this woman, but go ahead and take her because no one else in their right mind would ever want her. Let me continue on verse 7. Now, this was the custom, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. Like I said, this is a legal process that had to happen. So in verse 8, so when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Amalek and all that belong to Chilion and, and to Malon. And also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. In verse 11, Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel, May you act worthily in Ephraim, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this woman. So, just to follow what's going on, first there's a legal transaction, and it's a really strange one. <laughs> they raise sandals, and I don't quite get it. And obviously, this is why the, the editor probably puts this in here. It's what, what people think, kind of question who actually wrote this, because this was something that was long gone. It's a custom that was way, way back in the day. They used to raise sandals. But I understand, it's like shaking of hands or uh, signing dotted lines. Now you just exchange sandals. <laughs> I don't get it. But anyways, what's going on here? is Boaz is taking Ruth to be his wife. And in verse 10, you read it where it says, I bought Ruth to be my Bo Ruth the Moabite to be my wife. And you can read that and you can think, wow, this is just terrible. Like, where's the romance in this? Like, I, I bought her to be my wife. Now, you got to remember, like I said, it's a different time. This is a legal thing, a legal procedure. So when he says, I bought her, it's a legal thing that's saying, I have redeemed this woman to be my wife. I have paid off whatever debt she might have. Whoever she is in her past, I am redeeming her to be my wife. And now this woman, of who she was in her past, all of her past, everything she was, she's now going to rest in my house. She's going to rest with me, Boaz is saying. Her past is no more. What Boaz is saying is so amazing here. He's saying, I am restoring her to a different woman. She's no longer to be Ruth the Moabite. She's going to be Ruth the wife of Boaz. Ruth the wife of a worthy man. And through this redemption, she becomes worthy. You can see this so clearly by what the elders do when they, when they say to Boaz and to Ruth in verse 11. They say, may the Lord make this woman like Rachel and Leah. Now we can skip right over this and say, okay, well, that's, that's great with two women. But, but these two women, this is huge. These are two Israelite women. And these two Israelite women, they were the wives of Jacob, who parented the twelve tribes of Israel. These two women were worthy and very prominent women in that society. You can think of today of just, just two women that are honorable in our society. I don't know who we would say, but <laughs> for us, very different people. But let's just say like Mother Teresa, right? everyone loves her. So let's say put her up there, right? They, they, like that's who we're talking about here. May this woman be like her. And it's amazing that they, they, they're, they're comparing her. She's a Moabite. Remember, Israelites hate Moabites. They're saying, may she become like an Israelite woman. They're erasing her past. They're giving her a new future. And then they go on to say in verse 12, this is what's amazing, is they're saying, may this marriage, this new family, become like the family of Perez, who came through a very controversial family, uh, Judah and Tamar. I'm going to save that story for another time. But Judah and Tamar was a controversial case of levitrate marriage. But Perez, the son of Judah and Tamar, you got to understand, 
he was a very renowned name in that town. Most likely, what we can understand is that most of the people in Bethlehem, they came from Perez's lineage. The entire town was most likely somewhat related to this guy, Perez. So they're saying, basically, maybe Ruth, her whole identity changed. Everything about her, her whole entire past, she's no longer going to be a Moabite. She's now going to be, we're blessing her that she will become like these amazing Israelite women in our society. And then the redemption story continues in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her a conception, and she bore a son. They get married. They have a son, and Ruth, at this point, she finds rest. This is the, the, the author was going to shift gears here to look at Naomi's perspective for a minute. But this right here is what you see. The end of the story, they live happily ever after. Right? Now Ruth is married with Boaz. They have a child. They're a nice little they have a family together. It's great. It's warm. It's welcoming. We're so happy at this point. But let me continue on verse 14. So the author is going to change perspectives here to look back at Naomi. The woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. So what the author does here, I love this, he circles back around. In the beginning of the story, we started with looking at the story through Naomi's perspective. And the whole bulk of the middle part of the book was all looking from Ruth's perspective. So we ended Ruth's story, but we didn't end Naomi's stories yet. <coughs> Naomi, and Naomi has changed dramatically here. At the beginning of the story, we're introduced to a woman that's surrounded by death. She's a bitter woman. She says she's hopeless. She has nothing left. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. And now she's stuck with two Moabite women. We're introduced to a woman that is literally hopeless without a future. And we end the story with a woman holding a child. A woman, that sit, and a woman of the town that say this child very ironically in verse 15, may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. It's ironically because of who this child and his descendants are. And most importantly, this, this right here, we're going to look at this, this, this a lot in the rest of the sermon. Verse 14, this could be the headline of the entire book of Ruth. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. If you remember back what she probably told the same woman, Naomi, back in chapter 1. The same exact woman that, that were probably around here at this time. She told this woman back in chapter 1, verse, verse 20, when she returns back to her town, they say, is this Naomi? And then, then verse 20, she said to them, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly, very bitterly with me. And I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Basically, these women are saying back, they, they remember what Naomi said when, when she returned. They're saying, Naomi, the Lord has not forgotten you. He has not left you. He hasn't abandoned you. Instead, he has blessed you, Naomi. He has restored you. He has nourished you. But here's the thing. I don't think Naomi knew the impact of this marriage of Boaz and Ruth. I don't think that even Ruth and Boaz understood that who this child would become and who the child's child would become. And I don't think they understood the whole scope of everything God was do, doing. Could you continue on in verse 17? And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Obed was David's grandfather. We become a King David here. And then we end with his genealogy. And we all love genealogy, but this one right here is so important. Verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. 
Perez from Judah. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Benadab. As Benadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Now follow me on this. You think about this. Why did this book end with a genealogy? Seems strange, doesn't it? Like, why did this end with Naomi holding a baby and this end right there? Why did it end with the genealogy? Why not, well, they lived happily ever after, and they had, you know, kids, and, and oh, great, well, eventually this, this son, Obed, Father Jesse, and then Father David, why did it go on to bring out a genealogy? And the reason why is because you got to remember, the Bible is not a bunch of individual stories. They have no connection to each, other, to each other. The Bible is telling one complete story. It's telling a story of a person that would step foot into human history. A man that would walk the earth years later, that would be called the son of David. A man that would walk into human history that was a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. And it would be years later that a man by the name of John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would receive a vision and would see a descendant of Ruth and Boaz who would be the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the worthy redeemer. When John would see a vision of, a, of this man stepping forth and conquering so that we would not be left without redemption. Now, is this right here, uh, I was going to take this sermon in a totally different place. Now I was writing this late at night, one night this week, and I've become a night owl for some reason for the past few months. Um, but I was doing a search. I just said, you know, let's look up. I, I, you know, all throughout Scripture we, we find line of the tribe of Judah. You find it here throughout all the prophets. Uh, Jesus himself was called the son of David sixteen times in the Gospels. We always see this this son of David, the line of the tribe of Judah. But I try to find a place where they're mentioned together. Where's the place in Scripture where you can find Lion of the tribe of Judah and David together? And it came to a passage of Scripture that is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I have read it here often. And we even sang a song today that actually ties right into this, and it's what the angels would sing. It's in Revelation chapter 5. And when I read Revelation chapter 5, all I could think about in my mind is this is the story of Ruth. This is the story of Ruth. And I'm reading, I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is strange. It almost seems like it's written by the same author. Mm -hmm. like, it's so strange how they, they so interconnect. So, I want to read this to us. And like I said, I know if you've been here for a while, I have read this before, but here's the thing. I read this passage I, all the time, and every time I read it, it never gets old. Because this is the gospel. It's the greatest news in all the world. And listen, Christians, this can never get old. If this gets old, your faith is getting old. Your, your connection with Christ is, is dwindling. Like this can never, ever get old. So instead of making this sermon longer and more complicated than honestly it needs to be, I want to read Revelation 5. I want to read the first five verses here. And as I read this, I think we're going to see the redemption plan, God's redemption plan for us from the perspective of heaven. And I'm hoping and praying you see this in a whole different light from looking at the story of Ruth. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw the right hand of him, of, right hand of him who is seated on the throne. A scroll written written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? <laughs> and no one in heaven and on earth and under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. So understand what, what the Apostle John is seeing here. It's a future event. He's seeing God on the throne, and God is holding a scroll. And if you read the rest of the book of Revelation, what you understand is that when the scroll is finally open, all seven seals are open. What you find at the end of the book of Revelation, you find true rest for the soul. You find true peace. You find the ending of it all. You find, you find that finally things are restored to the way they were meant to be in the very beginning. 
Satan and death are defeated and thrown in the lake of fire. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more tears. And man and God are together once again the way they were commanded to be in the beginning of all creation. So you think about this, that what this scroll represents is it represents a future. It represents hope. That's what it represents. But then the angel says, with a loud voice, no one is worthy to open the scroll. Basically, looking at Ruth, what you can understand, what this angel is saying, there's no worthy redeemer. There's nobody that's going to redeem you. There's no hope. There's no future. There's nothing at all. And this is starting to sound like the story we just read, right? In Ruth. And then the Apostle John, when seeing this, when he was seeing this whole vision, the angel saying this, in verse 4, look what he does. And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Just John starts bawling his eyes out, I imagine, just getting down on his knees and crying. And of course he would. Every, every one of us would. There's no hope. Like you, you're looking at your life and you think, okay, well, maybe there's something at the other end of this. Maybe there's something good. There's nothing. Nothing good. This is Naomi in chapter 1. You say, call me bitter. There's no hope. There's no future. There's no redeemer. No one, no one worthy wanted to redeem them. Naomi is sitting there in Bethlehem, hopeless. And this is exactly what's happening to John when he's seeing this whole scene play out. John is faced with the idea there is no more hope. In the future, there's only more despair. You can see John saying the same thing Naomi said, call me bitter because that's my future. My future is utter bitterness. Just call me that. But, there's always a but in Scripture. As we read in Ruth chapter 4, verse 14, like I said, this could be the headline of the entire book of Ruth. And really the headline of our entire life. Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. In verse 5, it says this. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. This angel says, Weep no more. And why? Because the lion of what tribe? Judah. The root of who? David. And what is this descendant of Judah and of David, this descendant of Boaz and Ruth? What has he done? He's conquered. And what did he conquer? He conquered sin. He conquered sin. He did it justly. He did it by living a perfect life. He's the one person in human history that, that, that didn't deserve death. We all deserve death. I understand that. Because we've all sinned. He's the only one that didn't. He's the only one that could take our place. He's the only one that could took, take on all of the penalty of God's wrath. You understand, God is just. Sin has to be paid for. Someone has to take the punishment for the crime committed. And it's just as you look at Boaz. Boaz had to re redeem Ruth justly. This is why he went through the whole process of the legal procedures, why he did the whole thing. There's no cutting corners. Jesus conquered sin by basically taking our death penalty. It's our death penalty. He took it, and he did it justly. Then he conquered death, and he did it publicly. This wasn't no hidden act. It wasn't done in secret. Jesus died in public. He died in the public square on Mount Gol Golgotha on a mountain. Every single person would have seen him dead, and then he was placed in a tomb. He wasn't buried in the ground in some hidden place. He was put in a tomb for all to see, and the tomb was wide open. Then he appeared to hundreds after he died. He conquered death publicly, the very public event, just as Boaz redeemed Ruth publicly. It wasn't hidden. They didn't go elope somewhere. He did it publicly so every person could see Ruth is redeemed. Jesus conquered death publicly so there would be no mistake that he is the worthy redeemer. Why did he conquer? Same reason why Boaz conquered. The same reason why Boaz redeemed Ruth. It's to get his bride. To get his bride. It's to gain the one he loves so deeply. Jesus conquered to have his bride. A bride that is undesirable. <laughs> A bride that, as we look at Ruth, we look at how this other man treated her and how he was talking about her. That's us. 
That is us. It's a bribe that no other person would want, yet it's a bribe that he wants. And this is his plan. His plan before the foundation of the world. He planned our redemption. As you can see, the story of Ruth is part of that plan. This is why it's so important to understand the whole biblical context. You understand Ruth is place where it is to let us know there is a plan, there is hope, don't give up. He planned to get us back. It's his plan all along. And understand, I just mentioned this, but if you haven't quite done it yet, there's no doubt in the story of Ruth, we are all Ruth. We are helpless, we are unworthy, we are lost, we are the outcast, we are hopeless without a future. That is us. We're not Boaz. <laughs> Don't put yourself in that place. We are not Boaz. But here's the thing. Thank God we have no reason to weep or be bitter. We have no reason. Because we are not left without a Redeemer. We're not left. Our Redeemer has conquered so we could have rest. We can have rest. And we find that rest in Jesus. We find that hope in Jesus. We all need to cling to him. Ask him to provide. Ask him to protect. The same thing what Ruth did. Ask him to wrap his wings around us. To wrap his arms around us and redeem us. There's no other person that can. There's no other person that can. Because there's no other that has conquered. He is our re worthy redeemer. He's the only one that it has redeemed us. He's the only one that wants to redeem us. He's the only one. And Christians, understand this news. Like I said, in Revelation 5, this can never get old for us. It can never get old. And there's any non-Christians in here. This is the news that I have been praying for this entire week that would open your eyes. You would see that this morning that you have a Redeemer, a God that loves you, that came into human history to redeem you, to get you back, to conquer sin, to conquer death. He did this all so you could have life, so we could have life, and a life that we were created to have in the very beginning. A life of your Redeemer, a life that is full of joy. So here's the thing, I'll just end this this entire book of Ruth. We All of us, if we are Ruth, we need to do what Ruth did. Cling to our Redeemer. Run to our Redeemer and continually run to our Redeemer and find our protection, find our provision, find the abundance of everything we need in life in Him. Don't run to other things in this world, which we're all prone to do. And when we run to Him, we will find a worthy Redeemer like Boaz who will wrap His arms around us who will, who, will, who will comfort us. He will give us every single thing we are looking for in life. And you're not going to find it any other place in this, this world. He's the only worthy redeemer. And thank God we are not left this day without a redeemer. Mm -hmm. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, Lord, just thank you so much, God. Thank you that we are not left without you. You didn't abandon us. You had every reason to abandon us. It's just like the other redeemer said to Boaz, like, basically, what, what is wrong with you, man? <laughs> like, why would you want her? I, I look at myself, God. I think sometimes, why would you want me? But Lord, you do. And you have redeemed. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David that has conquered. You have conquered sin. You've conquered death. And there will be one day where all of this will be defeated, Lord. Lord, I pray for every one of us in this world. We will cling to you. Whether it be the first time we would ever, or right now, we would run to you, we would cling to you. We would find our redemption in you. We would find the love that you are extending towards us right now. May today be the day of our redemption. Every one of us, maybe something is the first time today is the day of your redemption. For us as Christians, Lord, I pray that we can cling to you on a daily basis. You're the only one worthy. You're the only one holy. You're the only one that really wants us, God. Help us to see this reality, Lord, today. And as we leave this place, God, I just pray that you would just fill us up. 
give us comfort and peace. Give us joy that will last the entire week. A joy that would radiate, radiate off us that other people would just see there's something different about us, God. God, do a work in our lives and do a work of those that we are in contact with every single day. Give us opportunities to, Lord, to share your good news. God, thank you for you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, so we're going to sing one more song together, church. Um, we're going to sing, uh, as you can tell, a Revelation song. And as we sing this, I just, just want us to just put yourself in that throne room scene. Put yourself in that scene where you are with, you are seeing this whole thing playing out. And put yourself in the scene maybe when you first gave your life to Christ, where you were literally hopeless. You were on just a, on, on a road bent to hell, literally. And finally, your Redeemer set in and it came into your life and it said, Come, come to me and I will give you rest. Just put yourself in that scene again. And I'm praying that the Spirit would say to you right now, weep no more. Weep no more. <laughs> You're not left without a Redeemer. Let's be on this thing, church.
Thank you.